Good evening. I knew that uh, Troy had asked me to prepare a message for tonight, so I did a few days ago, and I was praying about it and had the witness of the Holy Spirit that it was the word that the Lord wanted, and I kind of set it aside, and um, that was good. And then he gives me another message, and I go, well, what's going on? And then I find out that I'm going to be teaching uh, not this Sunday night, but the following Sunday night. And that's what that message was for. So I'm going to switch gears and go with the one that God put in my heart for tonight. And um, he's faithful to do that. He's faithful. Now, here at Calvary Chapel, uh, we teach verse by verse through the whole Bible. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, through its entirety. Uh, but obviously that's not possible tonight in this setting. So I'm forced to teach topically. So I was praying for what the topic would be, what the Lord would say tonight. And I believe I have the mind of the Spirit. So welcome everybody to Calvary Chapel, Grants Pass. And I dropped something. And uh, our online and radio audience, welcome. Glad that you're with us. Uh, before I open again in prayer, I wanted to share something with you. Uh, sometimes I feel like a broken record, like I'm saying the same things over and over again. But for those of you that are my age, you remember the LP vinyl records, the Polydors. The LPs were long play it was a record that you put and you set this needle on it and it would play at 33 and a third RPM. Well, I'm not, a, I'm not that. I'm not an LP album with lots of songs on both sides. But I have two sides and it's more like a 45. They were little and there was just one song on each side and it played at 45 RPM and I'm always having to hustle. I'm fighting that clock all the time to get it said. So I really only have one song on each side, and the first side is John 13, 34, John 15, 13, and following. In John 13, it says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. And on the other side is 2 Corinthians 5, 14, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So we have this situation where we've got a holy and righteous God, and we have fallen and sinful man. And how is God going to reconcile that? How could heaven be heaven if we went to heaven like we are? Something's got to change. Well, he's not going to lower the standard of heaven because it would cease to be heaven. So something else must have to happen. It says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that we might, excuse me, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's why he came. And every one of us is going to have to decide in our own heart if Jesus accomplished this or not. I believe he did. And my prayer is that you will too. Tonight's message won't be anything probably that you haven't heard. The difference is we're going to believe it. We're going to believe it. So if you bow your hearts with me, Heavenly Father, we come to you with humble hearts, confessing our need. We need you. We need your heart. We need your life. We need your love. We want to be all, Jesus, that you died and rose again for us to be that we might enjoy the fullness of everything that you intended for us. So, Lord, here tonight, help us through humility, being mixed with faith, enjoy all that you've done for us, that it might be realized in a literal sense in our life. So we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So if you would turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 17. We're going to look at a couple of Old Testament types. And in the Old Testament, we find pictures of Christ. I believe it's Hebrews that says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, for it's written of me to do thy will, O Lord. So we see that Jesus does come in the volume of the book. We find Christ on every page somewhere because it's all about him. I said it's all about him. Very good. So tonight's message is the hammer and the nail. That's the title. So please turn with me to Exodus chapter 17. And a little background on this. The children of Israel have already been led out of Egypt, out of Ramesses, and they've headed out in their trek across the wilderness. And they've already come to Piahiroth, which is about three sermons in itself. And there was the Red Sea crossing where we see a picture of of Pharaoh and his army destroyed, washed up dead on the shore of the Red Sea. And from there they went to the wilderness of Shur. And then from there they went to Merah, which is means bitter water. And there Moses threw in a tree that made the bitter water sweet. And of course, that's a type of Christ. It was probably a tree or hyssop. And when we add the cross, the tree, to life, it makes things sweet, makes things palatable for us. And moving on from there, they went to Elam, which is, there was a place of 12 wells of water. It was an oasis. There was 70 palm trees there. 12 is the number of not only the, uh, the patriarchs there that we see of each tribe of Israel, but we also see um, the elders of the church. And that's why there's 24 thrones that we see in the book of Revelation. And so that was a place of all that you need, counsel, wisdom, instruction, and so forth. And the next place they went was the wilderness of sin. That's very telling, isn't it? And there in that place is where they received the manna from heaven. And so all of this, in short, is a testimony of God's divine providence and his power. And they had seen the miracles that God did to cause Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go. And this mixed multitude, about three and a half million people, went out from Egypt, witnessing, being eyewitnesses to the power of God and the faithfulness of God. And have you ever seen the power and faithfulness of God in your life? On the heels of that, have you murmured and complained anyway? Okay, hopefully tonight we're going to get to the root of that problem and deal with it. So we're in Exodus 17, verse 1. Say amen if you're there. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin. Wow, that's very telling. But it means thorn. But that's telling as well. The thorn in the flesh. A thorn. According to the commandment of the Lord, encamped in Rephidim. And Rephidim means resting places. But there was no water for the people to drink, verse 2. Therefore, the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Verse 4. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and also take in your hand the rod with which you struck the river. Now that would have been the river Nile when it turned to blood. Same rod. And go, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. And Horeb also means desert and it is the place of Mount Sinai. And you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, and the people may drink. Now we know that this rock, uh, according to the New Testament, that rock was Christ. And when Moses struck the rock and water came forth, it's a picture of Jesus and his crucifixion on the cross. And that's why we know in Numbers, 
when Moses got angry with the children of Israel and he struck the same rock a second time when he was told to speak to the rock and water would come. He got angry and struck it a second time. Moses, the lawgiver, was not allowed to enter the promised land. And that's very important. I'm so thankful that the lawgiver didn't enter the promised land. But the one that took us into the promised land was Joshua, which is a type of Christ. Yeshua, Jesus, is the one that leads us in to the promises of God, not the law. So the type fits all the way through the New Testament. Verse 7, so he called the name of that place Masa, which means temptation, and Meribah, which means strife and contention. Because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Now, how many plagues did they have eyewitness to when they were delivered from Egypt? How many plagues? Anybody know? There was ten. They were eyewitnesses to the power and demonstration of God. They also saw that the enemy was destroyed there at the Red Sea. They sang a great song. Miriam led them in this great song. It was the right song, but on the wrong side. There's a lesson in that. Faith will sing the song of victory on the other side of the battle before it ensues. So they were really without excuse. They're murmuring against God, and they had seen miracles. They had seen the divine providence, the supply of God, his faithfulness, and they complained anyway. Verse 8, let's look at that. Now Amalek, and Amalek means dweller in the valley. And it has a secondary name that I'll get to here in a bit. Amalek, a dweller in the valley. Remember uh, Lot, he chose the lowland. What, where was the lowland? Sodom and Gomorrah. Easy living. Little work, great gain. Easy living. A dweller in the valley. You know, life is harder on the mountain. If you've ever been a, a mountain hillside farmer, you understand how hard it is to eke out a living on the mountain. But down in the valley, it's easy. And so these people down there of easy living we see Amalek, a dweller in the valley, came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Now, Rephidim is resting places. And, I, and there's about six different sermons in this thus far. But the enemy likes to come when we're at a place of leisure, when we're kicking back and our guard is down. And Amalek was also known for attacking the stragglers rather than a head-on confrontation with the armies of Israel. He'll attack the back row of the church. And I see it. People start in on the front row, and I've done it in my own life. Man, I'm on fire for God, and I'm sitting up front, and, and then I'm starting to cool off a little bit, and I some, sit somewhere in the middle, and just about a week before I abandon church altogether, I'll be sitting at the back. And we just subconsciously do that, and that doesn't mean everybody that sits at the back does that, because I used to sit in the back of the church on purpose so that I could pray as a gatekeeper to keep people in the sanctuary, keep them from running from God. I'd sit back there like a secret agent praying and interceding for them, right? So if you're sitting in the back, I'm not necessarily talking to you, but maybe the Holy Spirit is. I don't know. I can't even see back there that far. But Amalek attacks the back of the pack. He attacks the stragglers. He attacks us in a place of leisure when we let our guard down. Now, we see here in verse 9, And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Now, his rod is a picture of authority. Again, we're looking at types and shadows. Now, for Moses, his authority was the rod that God had given him. For the, what's the authority for a Christian? the name of Jesus, okay? 
the name of Jesus, praying in that great name. That is our authority. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Ur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was, verse 11, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Okay, what was in his hand was the rod, his authority. When he was lifting up the rod of authority, they were winning. When we're lifting up the name of Jesus in prayer, we're winning. When we get tired and relax, that's when the enemy is winning. Verse 12, but Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. We can see here clearly, clearly that the battle was won on the mountain in prayer, not down in the valley with the sword. Now, yes, Joshua is down in the valley with real swords. And they're in a fight for their life physically. But it wasn't won there. It was won on the mountain in prayer. So too, every battle that we go into, big or small, is won in prayer on the mountain. And as we pray, Jesus is prevailing in the valley of battle. Let me say that again. As we lift up our rod of authority, the name of Jesus in intercessory prayer, Jesus is fighting our battles for us in the valley of sin, winning. Amen. Okay. Verse 14. This is amazing. Did you know verse 14 is the first place that God ever told anyone ever to write anything down? See, this is chapter 17. This isn't chapter 20. Chapter 20, we have the law. God told Moses, make sure that you build everything according to pattern that you were shown on the mountain. So Mo wrote lots of stuff down on the mountain for 40 days. And indeed, God did write with his very fingers etched into the stone, the law. But the, he said, I want you to do something. I want you to write something down. Look at verse 14. This is the first place God ever said to write anything down. And that should be very telling to us. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book the book, and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Wipe him out from under my holy heaven, God is saying. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner, or Jehovah Nissi. And he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Every generation that's raised up has to defeat Amalek in their own life. Your parents can't do it for you. God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has firstborn sons. No grandkids. We can't come in on the coattails of our parents' faith. Every generation is going to enter into this battle. Because the Lord has sworn the Lord will have war with Amalek. Now, Amalek is clearly a picture of the flesh. He says, I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the sun. Now, Amalek was a grandson of Esau. Now, Esau was a man of the flesh. Esau I have hated and Jacob I have loved. Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup, had no regard unto spiritual things. He was a man of the earth, a man of the flesh, and sensual. Where Jacob had regard unto spiritual things, and this descendant of Esau, Amalek, he's also a type of sinful flesh. And his name could be translated literally, a people that takes away everything. It's the epitome of selfishness, or me first. Covetousness, pride, flesh, self-gratification, etc. Now, how will God accomplish this? He says, I'm utterly going to blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Write this down and read it in the ears of Joshua. 
How will God accomplish this? Or literally remove sinful flesh? This is the first words that God ever told anyone to write down. Tell Joshua. What is that, Joshua? Why Joshua? That God will utterly destroy sinful flesh. What's the Aramaic pronunciation of Joshua? It's Jesus. Joshua, Hebrew word, Yeshua, means the Lord is salvation. The Aramaic rendering of that is Jesus. Go and tell Jesus that I'm going to utterly destroy flesh from under heaven. How's that going to happen? Now, again, each one of us has to decide in our own heart whether Jesus was able to accomplish this. I believe with all my heart he has. Now, if you will, turn to Galatians chapter 5, and let's look at a little contrast between fallen man, the Adamic nature, We're sinners because we were born sinners. Adam fell. That third part died. He no longer had the ability to commune with God, and he began to operate in body and mind because the spirit of him had been darkened and no longer abil the ability to commune with God. So to that degree, Adam did indeed die the day that he ate of the fruit. So let's look at a contrast between the character, nature, and the spirit of God and the character, nature of fallen man. So Galatians 5, 13, say amen if you're there. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only don't use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You ever notice the flesh is antithetical to love? Love is others-oriented. Love always puts the cares and needs of others over themselves, where flesh always says, me first. Everything Jesus did, everything Jesus said was for the benefit of others. Jesus was the epitome of others-oriented. Through love, serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Verse 16. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another so that you do not do the things you wish. Now I put in parentheses here, the passage does not end here. The next verse says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And so many have taught, it's, see, it says that we're in a war between flesh and spirit, so we, hey, we can't do the things that we want. So people don't even try. See, we're in a war, and so Pastor Goodbody... I like Pastor Goodbody. He's always wrong, though. And Elder Do-Gooder come along and say, you see, you've got these two dogs in you. You've got this good dog, and you've got this bad dog. And you see, if you, if you feed the good dog, if I go to the prayer meeting, and I'm in his word, and I'm praying all day long, right? the fivefold graces of Christian maturity. And if I'm doing those things and I starve the bad dog, then I'll walk in the Spirit. God, that's not in the Word, by the way. That came from Pastor Goodbody and Brother Do-Gooder. It's not in here. God has a different plan than starving the bad dog. God wants to kill it. It's called the cross of Christ. See, we have this thought that we can try to take the old, animic, fallen nature and teach him how to behave. That if we give him enough tools and train him up and teach him the disciplines that he could learn to behave himself. But he never will. He cannot. It's impossible. Why? 
Because the Bible says that our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. That's our righteousness, our efforts to please God. Well, filthy rags, it's interesting. The Hebrew word actually means menstrual cloths, used ones. That's what God thinks about our efforts. But see, that's twofold. Not only is it defiled and unacceptable, but it's evidence of an empty womb. It can never give birth to the righteousness of God. Man cannot do it. God must do it. His answer isn't training the old man to act better. The answer is killing him and raising him up to a new creation. And that works every time. But I get ahead of myself. So verse 17, then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So we're still in Galatians 5. The next verse uh, continues on with our comparative study of the two natures. Verse 19, we're looking at the description of fallen man, Amalek, the flesh, Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions and heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I told you beforehand, just as I told you in times past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, to bail you out a little bit, the word practice in the Greek is proso, is very similar to poieo, but it means to be busy with, a lifestyle. If a man stumbles and falls into sin, is it a forfeiture of salvation? No. But if he continues in an unrepentant life, it's evidence that there's no salvation there because it says clearly in this passage that those who practice such things shall not enter the kingdom of God. So it's a serious issue. How is God going to make us ready for heaven? If since he's not going to wink at sin, he must do something to get us from here to there. Something powerful, something dynamic had to change. In fact, not only change who we are, but what we are. And it came at the greatest cost that could ever be paid. The next two verses describe God's nature, verse 22. But the fruit, notice it's singular, the fruit, definite article, of the Spirit could be thus described, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. That's Jesus. That's who he is. So here we see the nature of God and the nature of fallen man. How does God reconcile these two natures? He doesn't. One's got to go. Which one do you think's got to go? I just bet it's the fallen nature's got to go. Verse 24 tells us how. And those who are Christ, present continuous, those who are Christ have, past tense, crucified, past tense, the flesh with its passions and desires. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So the answer is the cross. The cross is the greatest negative, the greatest subtraction in all the universe. By the cross of Christ, God has removed all that is displeasing to him. The resurrection is the greatest positive, the greatest addition. The resurrection of Jesus is the method by which God has secured all that is precious to him in Jesus. And everything outside of Christ eventually will be gone. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth for the former things have passed away. And God, the Father, has put in the one safe place in Jesus all that's precious to him. Are you in Christ tonight? Or are you outside of Christ tonight? 
If you're in Christ, you are most certainly very secure. As it says, go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If I can get my mouth to work, we might get through half of this. 2 Corinthians 5. So exciting. It is just so exciting to me. And our only part is to believe it. He's already done it all. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is where? In Christ. In Christ. Well, how did we get there? I'll explain that in a minute. If anyone is in Christ, he's a, a new creation. That means a brand new creation that never existed before, completely unused life. Your history doesn't go past the cross. I'm only 34, 35 years old. That's it. My history doesn't go past that. And I'll prove that to you in the scriptures. He's a new creation. Old things have passed away. There goes Adam. Say goodbye to your old man. Behold, all things have become new. And you know what all means in the Greek? It means all. All things have become new. How did this happen? Fast forward to verse 21. Let's look at the substitutionary work. It's so important that we lay hold of these immutable truths because the devil's lied to the church for too long. And the victory was always ours, only we knew it not. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he, that is capitalized in one of your new translations, that's speaking of the Father, made him, him is capitalized, that's speaking of Jesus. You with me so far? For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's substitution. As Spurgeon says, Jesus stood before the Father as you and was judged so that we could stand before the Father as him in a right relationship. We traded places. Colossians says that he took our sin into his own body. The handwriting of requirement that was against us being nailed where? To his cross. He became the culpable party, not you. You are justified by the blood, declared innocent. It's not a pardon. A pardon is where the governor gives you a pardon. Everybody in town knows you did the crime, but you're not going to have to pay for it. That's a pardon. That is not justification. Justification means declared innocent. And the only way that could happen is someone else became the culpable party, the guilty party. Christ became sin for you and for me so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. So this truth is imputed and imparted. It's both positional and practical. We see our positional righteousness in Romans chapter 5, the first four verses. We're justified by faith in Christ, justified, declared innocent. It's a legal term, and that's great, but that's only half the story. It's not only a positional truth, but it's a practical truth and reality because it's both imputed and imparted. His righteousness is imputed into our account. It's like you put a million bucks in my account. He wrote the check, deposited it, that's in my account. God sees me in his righteousness. But it's more than that because it's also imparted. The very life of Christ, the holiness of Christ, the resurrection life of Christ is now flowing through me. As it says in Romans chapter 8, therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And here's the reason why. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Remember I said Mo couldn't enter the promised land? I'm so glad the lawgiver didn't enter. Because we can't enter into the promises of God through keeping the law. 
Verse three, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Excuse me. Verse four says that, the purpose of the first three verses, that the righteous requirement of the law Not the Mosaic law, not the Levitical law, not the ceremonial law, but the righteousness of it. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That is the imparted life of Christ. We have the imputed righteousness and the imparted righteousness. We have the positional truth. We also have the practical outworking of his life his righteousness in our life. That's why all of these things are in the aorist tense. Those who have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, Galatians 5, 24. It's pointing to the cross. These are immutable truths that are a one-time perfect event in the past that can only point to the cross, the death and the resurrection of Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 1, 30 It says, but of him, speaking of the Father, you are in Christ Jesus. I couldn't demand that Jesus would come into my heart, neither could I get into his. According to John chapter 17, we became one. Of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. When did all this happen? The moment I believed upon Christ, the moment you believed upon Christ, the Father took you and put you in Jesus. And at that moment, he became for you all that you needed. And from his point of view, that righteousness was imputed into your account. But the moment you believe it, the very life of Christ being imparted to be lived out through you in a practical sense. Why? Because it's in the aorist tense. It means it's a past tense event. It's already done. It's called the finished work of Christ. See, we all believed that if we put our faith in Jesus, Pastor Goodbody and Elder Do-Gooder did the best they could, and they told us, you know, if you believe in Jesus, you'll be forgiven. You'll be justified and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And they're right. And God will forgive you all your sins, and he'll take your sin as far as the east is from the west. And they're right. And you're going to get to live forever with God. And they're right. But the rest of the story is that we enter into death with Christ, crucified, buried, united together into one life, and raised from the dead to walk in the newness of life. That's called sanctification, cleansed and set apart for God. See, here in America, we've only laid hold of one half of the truth. That's why we're saved but miserable when, we're, when we could be saved and so happy. We hadn't really heard the rest of the story. We do it every communion Sunday. We, we partake of the blood and the body, but only understanding the work of the blood. We're only seeing the justification and we're missing where it says that we're sanctified by the body of Christ. We're cleansed and set apart through death and resurrection. Well, I've been saved a little while and I only believed half of the story for, oh, I think the first 14 years of my walk with the Lord. Um, I was about seven, seven years old in the Lord when uh, he really began to do a powerful work in my life, and I, I received and understood the call of God. And seven years later, I got filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time in my life. And man, did things begin to change. And I realized the power of God through the anointing of God. But seven years after that, I discovered the reality of the imparted life of Christ. This is resurrection life. And that I didn't have to try now. I didn't have to try to try to starve out the bad dog and feed the good dog enough that I could walk right and walk in love and victory. All I needed to do was 
read the word and believe it. And the day I believed it, my life changed. And my wife got a new husband. You can ask her about that. Do I have time? I don't know if I have enough. How fast can you guys read along with me? Turn to Judges chapter 3, and we'll move real quick through this one, because it's another picture. We're looking at types and shadows of this truth, this truth of our being set free from the old man. That God was going to utterly blot out flesh, Amalek, from under his holy heaven and how that was going to be accomplished. There's another type and shadow in Judges chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 12, we're going to go to chapter 4, 1, if you want to go there while I'm reading. Judges 3 and 12, it says, The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, this is a pattern he warned them about. And I believe it was Deuteronomy 8, the blessings and cursings. In other words, if you guys do good, I'm going to bless you. And if you mess up, I'm going to just let everything fall apart in your lives. So we see the blessings and cursings in this merry-go-round of them doing good for a season and then falling back into sin. And there's an answer for it. That's why God was showing us that that didn't work. The children in Israel as they were going through the wilderness wanderings for 40 years, not one of them but Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land. Joshua being a type of Jesus and Caleb being a type of faith in the modern age. They entered the promised land. Everybody else died in the wilderness. Everyone who was 20 years old and younger at the time that the 10 spies and that came back with the evil report Everyone who was 20 years and younger, they're the ones that got to go into the promised land. The old grumbling crowd did not. Why? God swore in his wrath, it says in Hebrews, they shall not enter my rest. Why? Because of unbelief. You want to enter into the promises of Christ? It's going to require faith. You're going to have to read it and believe it. I don't have time, but if we look at some of the writings of Hegel, we can see that there was a separation that began in the 15th century be called what was called upper story and lower story. In other words, these immutable truths are only true, but not here. They're true in the sweet by and by, but there is no practical holiness in our life as long as we're in this flesh. And they began to believe that in the 15th century. And it's simply not true. You, it's not the writings of Paul. The Pauline doctrine, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is very clear that we can be shed of him through the cross of Christ, through faith. All right, chapter 4, verse 1. After Ehud had delivered Israel by killing King Eglon of Moab, who had gathered the people of Ammon and Amalek against Israel. No, God sent the enemy against Israel to teach him a lesson so they'd repent. And this is the cyclical pattern that he warned them about in Deuteronomy 8. 4 verse 1, When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the land of Jabin, excuse me, the hand of Jabin. Now here, Jabin is a picture of Satan. And Jabin means whom God observes. God's eye is on the devil. King of Canaan who reigned in Hazor, the commander of his army was Sisera. Sisera is a picture of the flesh. His name means battle array, who dwelt in Herosheth, Hagoyim, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had nine hundreds of chariots of iron, and for twenty years he harshly oppressed the children of Israel. Now, Jabin's a type of Satan, keeping us oppressed, keeping us in bondage, keeping us in addiction. Whispering in her ear, it's okay that you have a loss of temper after all your Irish. And all the excuses that come up, well, God knows how I am, and that's okay because he loves me. And all the bondages that he uses to keep us down and, and rife with sin. Jabin, the type of Satan, keeping us in bondage. Now Deborah, verse 4, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came to her for judgment. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam from Kadesh in Naphtali. 
and said to him, has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Nephtali and the sons of Zebulun, and against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army. So here it's saying Sisera is the commander of Jabin's army. The 900 chariots are, are commanded by Sisera. Jabin is a picture of the devil, and here Sisera is a picture of the flesh, and the flesh is Satan's commander of his army. Satan's using the flesh to keep you in bondage. You know, the only authority Satan has in our lives is that which we give him through unbelief. I'm convinced a child of God that's 30 minutes old in the Lord has more power in their pinky than all the devils of hell. He just may not know it yet. But he does. A rod of authority, the name of Jesus. Verse 8. And Barak said to her, If you go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. Another beautiful sermon here. Uh, about, you know, if God can't get a man to do it, he'll get a woman to do it, right? So she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking, for the Lord will sell sister into the hand of a woman. And a Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. But the glory wasn't to Deborah. It was another gal God had in mind whose name was Wild Mountain Goat. Yep, it's true. Yael. Verse 10. And Barak called Zebulun and Nephtali and Kadesh. He went up with 10,000 men under his command, and Deborah went up with him. Now, this took 263 years, took place 263 years after the Exodus story. Now, Heber the Kenite. Heber is the first place we see the word for Hebrew, and Heber may actually have been the beginning of the name Hebrew. The children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. So these are the descendants of Jethro, Moses' uh, father-in-law, 263 years later. And had separated himself. So Heber, the Kenite, separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the tabernacle tree as Zaanam, which is beside Kadesh, verse 12. And they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So Sisera gathered together all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron. And with this, we see all the excuses. Think of a cold iron trap like a bear trap. 900 of them holding you down, keeping you chained and bound in iron. And all the people who were up with him from Herosheth Haguyam to the river Kishon, verse 14. Then Deborah said to Barak, Up! For this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera, the flesh, <laughs> into your hand. Has, has not the Lord gone out before you? Folks, has not Jesus already gone to the cross? Has Jesus already not included you on his cross and buried with him and raised to a new creation? Up. Let's believe it. Get our minds up. Up. For this is the day. Has the Lord not gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. So now the flesh is ducking out, leaving the battle and trying to hide. But Barak pursued the chariots with the army as far as Herosheth Hegium, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. Not looking too good for the flesh, is it? Verse 17. However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Yael, and the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite, don't have time to go in there, but it was likely done purposefully so that it might be entrapment um, for Sisera. Verse 18, And Yael, 
went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, and do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. Now, i got to get this picture. He's been in a fierce battle for probably 18 hours. He is completely separated from his troops. He's on foot. He's not in a chariot. He's probably very thirsty and very exhausted and very hot. So she brings him into the tent and covers him with a blanket. Then he said to her, please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a jug of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. So he's hot, he's exhausted, he's dehydrated. Milk is something that you don't give to a person that's dehydrated. Plus, it'll put you right to sleep, right? Verse 20, and he said to her, stand at the door of the tent. Now, he asks for water, now he's giving commandments. And that's what the flesh does. You give him an inch, he'll take a mile. And if any man comes and inquires of you and says, is there any man here? You shall say, no. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple and it went down into the ground for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. And then Barak pursued Sisera, and Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera, the flesh, dead, with a peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the, of the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So what is this saying to us? The tent peg is a nail. And a nail is symbolizing perfectly the cross of Christ. And the hammer, the word of God has always been called the hammer. And Sisera, our old man, our atomic nature. Jabin, the devil. Exodus 17, 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Yeshua, Jesus, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Now, how did Jesus accomplish this through the cross? Folks, the coming of Jesus was not a backup plan because Adam fell in the garden. It says in Revelation 13 that the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. Plan A works every time if you're God, by the way. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6. I'm almost out of here. Got you out of here. Romans chapter 6, the first 14 verses are arguably the 14 most important verses in the Bible. Romans 6, verse 6 says, knowing this, and this word knowing is gnosko. It means an intimate understanding, an experiential understanding. And this is the problem. This is the part I didn't know for the first 21 years of my walk with the Lord. I was suspicious of its truth, but I didn't really believe it. Knowing this, knowing it, that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Do you know that? Galatians 5.24 says, Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now through faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross, take the nail that represents the cross of Christ. Take the hammer that represents the word of God and go to your old man, the man of sin, and look at verse 14, Romans 6. And go to your old man, the man of sin, and drive this nail of truth home. It says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the dominion of Jabin any longer. 
Sisera has been killed. Take the cross, the truth of the cross, and your inclusion on it. Let me read very quickly. Go back to the top of Romans 6, and then we'll pray. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Did you know you died to sin? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, this word united, symphutas, means conate, of the same origin, one seed. Certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Likewise, you also. The word reckon here is not our southern way of reckoning. Well, I reckon it so. The word's logizomai. It's an accounting term. It means logic. Two plus two is four. Let's see. If the moment I believed Jesus came into my heart and the Father put me in Christ and Christ went to the cross, then I went to the cross. And if Christ was buried, then I was buried. And if Christ was raised, I was raised with him. For all things work together for our good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknew, he did also predestine to be conformed to the image of Christ, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8, 28 and 29. Reckon it so. It doesn't mean reckoning is, there's no power in it. It's just the realization. It's logical. Add it all up. If you're in Christ, you're dead, and you have no rights, and your life is no longer your own, and it doesn't matter what he does with you. You were purchased at a great price, the greatest price that could ever be paid. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, it's unethical that a righteous man would die for a sinner, but it is also true, and we must believe it. And now all that he is is ours. Of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the things that we need, wisdom from God, righteousness, redemption, and sanctification, so that if any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Now, all... All that he is is mine and yours in a practical sense. We have his positional righteous imputed to our account, but we have the practical righteousness of Christ living through us, through the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verse 3 and 4. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. You have a choice. You don't have to. It doesn't have authority over you. You're not under the dominion of the slave master of sin. You died and you were raised to a new creation. And now you're in the dominion, the domain of the king and under his authority. Verse 13, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness and take that nail and the hammer and put it on the temple of your old man that's plaguing you and in cahoots with the enemy and take this truth and drive it home deep. And you know, Yael didn't walk up and tap at it. She placed it well on his temple and she drove this truth home. Sin shall not have dominion over me. 
this is just the Word of God. I'm just telling you, Pastor Goodbody and Brother Do-Gooder were wrong. They didn't tell you the whole story. That's all. I'm just saying. Because we're not only justified by the one work of Christ, but we're also sanctified by the one work of Christ. And this is something He has already done, and it will become ours in a practical sense the day we believe it. The day we believe it. Let's stand and pray. I was reminded by something that I read years ago, and I, I think it was the Holy Spirit. Forgive me if it's not, but what I remembered is that I was, every time I come to the pulpit, I should preach like it's my last time. And these immutable truths are ours through faith because Jesus has already done it. He's already been the propitiation for our sins. The price has already been paid and the Holy Spirit's already been given. And these truths are ours through faith tonight. Father, thank you. Now through the foolishness of the message preached, Lord, we ask God that you would make sense of the word to each heart here through revelation of the Holy Spirit that we might come to know you and what you've done for us. As we sing our first song tonight, whom the Son has set free, is free indeed, actually and literally free. Here all through the house tonight, may hearts be free, completely shed of the old man through faith in Christ. Perhaps many of them didn't know what you did as we call the finished work of Christ. Lord, I ask your blessing that we won't quickly discount the message, but Holy Spirit, you'd remind us and help us to look into these things and be good Bereans and see if they be so. Now I ask your blessing on these, your people. May your peace be with them. In Jesus' name, amen.